I guess sorry you missed the first, um, people watching the recording you probably missed the first part but uh, you didn't miss that much so we're breaking up the dynamical system of the universe into these smaller subsystems and you obviously would have seen the picture before which um, everybody always shows in every single talk which is start with the big bang here and you get your whole big evolution here and here's today and you get all these like cake slices in the middle and so what i'm talking about is separating these uh little separate systems so as we all know in the beginning you have um inflation and that takes some kind of initial condition that um quantum fluctuation from early universe although we don't really know much about that at the moment so is anybody's guess but given some inflation model we can get uh, using reheating to get the initial conditions for the next stage of evolution. So that's how um, reheating produces all the standard model energy density. And then going through stages like BBN and then CMB, uh, reionized ion, okay, sorry, I'm all using the English print, uh, spelling for this, reionization. And then we have lay time structure formation. So yeah, so this is what I'm talking about when I say you can have these little initial conditions and the final uh, state and using that as initial condition for the next stage of evolution and you push this forward and forward. And so far in terms of literature, we have a pretty good handle on most of the early universe stuff. Um, there are different models that you can calculate uh, inf uh, different inflation scenarios. BBN have, um, okay, I, I don't know too much about BBN, but the last time I checked it was a bit problematic. But it's, the mechanism is pretty well understood. Uh, CMB, probably one of the best evolved um, system in the early universe right now with um, any Boltzmann code such as class or CAM can give you the result very quickly and down to a very good position. And so the only missing part is really this last bit, the structure formation bit. How do we get the initial condition, which is the final state coming out of the CMB and the universe cool down to let gravity be the only dominant factor how do we get that evol evolution down to today so then we can compare that to the large, large scale structure surveys that we see um, at lower redshifts? So, this last dynamical evolution is the main focus for n body simulations. And it is computationally very difficult because the large potential for it to go highly nonlinear. So, you can't uh, rely on perturbation theory um, down to um, very late times. So it becomes rather a numerical challenge that in theory is not technically too hard um, when you're looking at what physics are involved. So now let's look at what physics are involved. So we start with Newtonian mechanics. So we start with a very simple universe. So let's assume we have a static universe that isn't expanding. And there's only a, sim uh, a single type of matter. So cold dark matter would be a good example, a good candidate for this exercise. And we want to just write down all the equations and motions governing this matter. So if we have a single species of cold matter, then what that impl um, you can assume is that the pressure is zero. So it's a pressureless dust. And the only term left in your um, stress energy tensor is the T00 component and that's the energy density. This is the only non-zero contribution. And now if you solve the Einstein equation um, using this energy stress tensor, then you, uh, and then taking the weak field limit, wrong thing, weak field limit. So basically taking the Newtonian limit, what you get is the very familiar Poisson equation. So I'm gonna write it in a slightly strange notation, so bear with me. So di, di, di. sorry, um, and that's equal to four pi g rho. So uh, yeah, this is a little convoluted looking because I want to um, keep note of this subscript r to remind ourselves that this is in static space. So this is not the same as um, when we are uh, moving to expanding space. Can I move down with this? Yeah, we'll go to the next slide. Oh, good, next slide. 
Did I? Yeah. I, I was just been clearing um, the yeah, writing. Clear like yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, got it. Okay. So now we have the Poisson equation. The, the next two, we use our conservation laws. So we first look at mass conservation. So from mass conservation, you get the continuity equation. And again, I have to write this in a slightly convoluted way right now. So rho plus j rho u j equals zero. Okay, um, you might see this more commonly as um, dt plus, uh, dt rho plus rho u. And that's equal to zero. You might see it more like this normally. But it's, it's essentially the same thing. So all this is saying is that any kind of change in the matter density, uh, any change in the density has to be related to physical chunks of the matter entering or leaving the local volume. And from momentum conservation, you get the Euler equation. So the Euler equation is R D T rho U I So Euler equation is the telling you that any change in the momentum or the velocity of your um, fluid or matter has to be associated with either momentum transfer by colliding with other chunks of matter or accelerating due to being the presence of a gravitational field, or in this case, gravitational potential phi. And the, okay, the, these two equations, they look a bit like I pulled them out of thin air right now, but you can derive them from perturbation theory. So if you look into Bauman's lecture notes, um, it, he does go through this quite uh, thoroughly, but you can motivate them by just uh, thinking about the conservation laws because momentum conservation and mass conservation has to hold regardless how you, uh, what starting point you go from. So yeah, now we have these three equations. We technically can just solve them. There's, they form a closed system. And uh, well, right now solving them is not gonna be very interesting because we're still in static space. So what we want to do before we start thinking about solving them is generalizing this to expanding space time. So what that implies is we now no longer have a static uh, distance r, we now have a expanding distance as the A is the scale factor. And X is the co-moving coordinate. So X stays constant with time, but the physical distance R as the universe expands is gonna get longer and longer. So now if you want to rewrite the Euler continuity and the Poisson equation within this expanding space time, we can just relabel all of the velocity and energy density however we want uh, in terms of whatever variable, but the derivatives will be changed. So if you have the spatial derivative in the R coordinate, as you can see from just this um, definition here that it, you're gonna pick up a factor of um, inverse A when you change into the derivative for, uh, right, uh, here we go, um, in the X uh, co-moving coordinate. And then to look at how we get the time derivative, we have to look at the total differential. So if I have some variable, uh, some function f, that's a function of the physical distance r and time, the total derivative should be the time derivative plus the spatial derivative. And the same function in co-moving coordinate will have a very similar form, except the derivatives will be in terms of the co-moving uh, coordinate. Uh, and then we just have to compare terms here and then we can see that dRi will equal xi dA plus a dxi and that's equal to a xi dt plus a dxi. Okay, that's just from the definition of taking the derivative of R. And then 
running out of room here. So we eventually get dt f dt is plus x di f dxi is equal to r dt f dt plus a dot on a Okay, and now if we just look at compared the terms on the two um, two sides, we can find the expression for transforming the time derivative in the r and the physical coordinate into the co-moving coordinate given to you by this relation. So this is the important equation. So this is the first one. This is the other one. Using these two um, derivative transformations, we can then rewrite all the equations in terms of the uh, co-moving coordinate x instead of the physical coordinate. So essentially generalizing the whole system into an expanding background. So you can do this as, as an exercise, but it's a, just chasing a bit of algebra. So, but the end result you should get is in co-moving coordinate, your Euler equation, oh, sorry, your continuity equation becomes Yeah, right. where v is the proper velocity. And your Euler equation becomes dt a to the four rho vi. vi v j. Okay, so the problem with this expression, if you're looking at this now, is that your continuity equation looks relatively fine. It still says exactly what it says before, except you picked up some factors of uh, scale factor in there. But your Euler equation start looking a bit crazy, especially the second term. It doesn't look intuitive um, or like correspond to any kind of physical gravitational source term. So we want to redefine our gravitational potential to make this look a bit more sensible. And so this motivates the introduction of something called a peculiar potential. Peculiar potential and usually is done by VARFI and is defined as the physical potential that we have before uh, just normal phi plus this weird term that we don't really like, x squared on two. Yep, so if we now use the peculiar potential and put it back in the Poisson equation, we can see we get something that they eventually call um, gene swindle. And you'll see why it's a swindle. Um, so your Poisson equation, if you rewrite it in co-moving coordinate and in terms of the peculiar potential is four pi g a squared rho of x and tau minus the average density of the universe. So you get this term out from the second derivative of a, a double dot x squared on two and then using the second Friedman equation. But yeah, now you can see that this, they call it a swindle because if you look at the Poisson equation now, the Poisson equation, um, the gravitational potential is no longer sourced by the energy density, but rather the energy over density over the, um, the average in the universe. Uh, they, some people didn't like it, so they called it a swindle, but I find it actually quite intuitive in the infinite universe sense. So if, you're in, if your universe is completely homo homogeneous and is infinite, then every local chunk of matter will feel the same amount of gravitational pull in every direction. And not, no clumps will ever form because it will uh, always be in an equilibrium. So the only time you can exert any kind of force on the surrounding region is if you have more than the average in some local area then you can generate some kind of gravitational pull that's not going to be balanced out by every other direction. Oh, um, by the way, yeah, feel free to stop me anytime if I say anything wrong. <laughs> uh, and yeah, also feel free to like ask any questions if it's not clear. But yeah, so now we have- time instead of normal time. Sorry? 
You just changed to conformal time instead of normal time. Um, yeah, I don't think that would. Um... No, no, it, it's just, yeah, that yeah. your time coordinate changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I'm deriving these, I uh, probably change the conformal time here as well. So when you, if you're going home and doing an exercise for these two equations, you probably have to do the uh, conformal time change. Conformal time only changes the factor interval for uh, temperature. So the Poisson equation, the formal Poisson equation is not affected by the time variable you use. So what you have there is fine. What you want to be doing for formal or the time variable. The time variable is what you have. Oh, yeah. change, however, is the, um, the, the continuity equation. Uh, Euler definitely, definitely yeah. the Euler equation will have a different factor of um, uh, in front of H. A, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So yeah, for the Euler and continuity equation, you probably have to be careful. For the Poisson equation, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, you can keep going. You can s solve this set of equations with perturbative expansions and keep um, trying with perturbation theory. But at this point, I want to just pause and say, okay, can we just brute force solve this now? Like, if we're not that smart and we just want to get some answer out of it. And if we step back and just look at this, um, the physical situation or like what is necessary to solve the system, we've realized that this Poisson equation actually is the only piece of information that we need. We don't really have to care about the Euler and continuity equation because for the Poisson equation, we can easily get the gravitational potential out of it. Right? Equals um, 4 pi g a squared rho minus rho bar. So if I can get the gravitational potential out of the Poisson equation somehow, then I could differentiate the gravitational potential to get the force and then using the force to move all the particles around and let them know what to do next. And then once the particles are being moved, I then go back and ask, okay, what's the new gravitational potential and what's the new force of gravity? And then keep going through this um, process cyclically. And that can perfectly evolve the system without needing to ask what the continuity or the Euler equation is. At least I think so, like it should be fine. So if you can solve just the Poisson equation, then we essentially can start brute forcing the system immediately. And that's essentially what the embodied uh, system does. So we have this average um, energy density, which is an input parameter, because this concerns how much dark matter we have. And this is essentially um, something that's predicted by a, uh, high energy, uh, by a model. So this is not something that you have to solve for at every time, uh, time step. This, the density here, this you can ask for in a simulation. Because if you have a box and you have particles flying everywhere, then it's quite easy to just ask where the particles are and that gives you your density field and at every single position, what the density is at that point. So if I have the information on the right-hand side, then I can easily invert this uh, function, uh, invert this equation and get the gravitational potential. Okay, I have to do it in Fourier space. Okay, so I should probably do this properly. So if I do this in Fourier space, so essentially if I take the Fourier transform of my left-hand side of the equation, then my Laplacian gets replaced with just K or K's, like minus K squared. So I get minus K squared phi of K is equal to four pi G A squared delta rho. So delta rho is defined as rho minus rho bar. So now we can see that we can very easily just get phi out from this. So the gravitational potential is just minus four pi g a squared on k squared delta rho in k space. So at every point in the simulation, if the n-body code is able to tell you what the energy density is, and at every um, then you can work out what the gravitational potential is, and from the gravitational potential, you can work out what force is going to um, be applied on the particles in the next time step, and so on and so forth. So. This is in essence what an embodied code is trying to solve for. Okay, maybe not a particle particle code, but like most like usable embodied codes uh, do it by this way. 
So any questions so far? So that's the background kind of bit. Now I'm going to move into um, details about that embody simulation. So any questions at this point? All good, yeah. Okay. So now we look into what makes up an embody simulation. So in an embody simulation, the necessary components are a box, particles, a force solver, and a time stepper. So obviously you need some kind of defined volume to do a simulation in, and you put the particles inside, which are represent, uh, representative of the matter that you're trying to model. And the force solver does what we tried to say um, just then to try to uh, solve the Poisson equation somehow with um, there's several different methods to doing so. And then time stepper tells you how often you should resolve the force. So uh, if the force is quite weak, you can allow the particles to drift for a very long time before stopping them again. Whereas if the force becomes complicated and you have to have very fine time steps. So starting with a box, the box is, the box is a essentially the co-moving volume of the universe. But because of the limitations on computational resource, you're never gonna be expected to simulate the actual entire universe. That would cost too much computation power. So usually the box is just a subset of the universe or like a fraction of the observable universe. That's fine, but one problem if you do it naively by just having a box of some size and then start putting particles inside is you'll realize that it doesn't matter how you start the simulation unless you put them completely homo homogeneously. Since gravity clumps together, if you start putting particles inside a box, they'll all just fall into the center because they'll all just clump together into one giant blob. That's how gravity works. So to prevent this collapse into this one giant spherical object in the middle, what we have to do is to make it a periodic box. So impose periodic boundary condition. So by imposing periodic boundary condition, what we're saying is that we have our actual box in the center. But then for every, um, we imagine that there are other boxes around our initial box. And this goes on infinitely. So I keep stacking boxes around. So particles inside my original box, they don't just uh, respond to the forces of other particles inside um, the original box. They will also see particles on these image boxes and they will also feel force getting pulled that way. So that balances out and prevents um, just every single time you run a simulation, you get a spherical collapse in the middle. And I guess it also ensures that you have a conservation of particle number because if a particle exits the box on one side, it automatically re-enters the box on the opposite side. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's true. So yeah, um, also prevents you losing particles or imposing some weird reflective boundary condition. I will also add that uh, it's also reflective of the cosmological principle, which states that um, the universe works the same everywhere in all directions. Yeah, so you can only do this because of the isotropy and homogeneity. Okay. Yeah. Statistically. Yeah, so yeah, choosing the box size, you have to think about these kind of things, so we'll get to that um, as well. But yeah, so the way to impose this periodic boundary condition is to do it like a Pac-Man um, box. So like Jan said, if you accidentally run your way out this side, you'll come back through the opposite side. Same for any direction, and you come back this way. So in any of the eight directions, that you, Wait, how many sides of a box? Six, six, uh, eight. six, six. 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 <laughs> so if you exit any, uh, in any six directions of the box, you just come back on the other side. So, yep, and the box, you have to be mindful of how big, uh, when you're choosing the box. Another thing is that, like I said, the input parameter we're interested in is the density. So that's the, I can't draw. okay, density of matter. So since we're not imposing the input parameter as a 
total mass that we put inside the box, but rather a density inside the box. The larger the box, then we're automatically picking, we're automatically also inferring that we're including more matter inside the box. So if the number of particles is a limited resource and you start picking larger and larger boxes, what that automatically means is that you'll start getting worse and worse particle resolution because you're fixing the uh, density rather than the total mass in the box. So yeah, that leads to the next point, which is the particle number. The total particle number is the largest overhead in terms of computational resource when setting up a simulation. So total particle number. So you can, they call it n-body simulation because you have n particles in there. The problem with these n particles is that they are not actually real particles. So for example, when we're modeling dark matter, if you have a box around a GPC cubed size and you have a billion particles inside, each particle is gonna represent several galaxies in mass. They're not gonna be representing an actual single dark matter particle because we can't afford to do that. And also no one can really tell us how heavy a dark matter particle is anyway. Uh, at least not now. So these are essentially discrete form, uh, discrete representations of your matter fluid that um, we've introduced before. So yeah, these are the main chokehold on the computation resource because you need to save all the information about these particles in the simulation. So some necessary infos are like at any given point in time, you need to know the particle's position. You need to know its velocity you need a unique ID for the particle because the way um, parallelization works, you have different processes handling the same box. So if I chuck one particle from one processor to the next one, they need some unique identification to track them in case they get uh, lost on the way. And there's some other things. If you include hydrodynamics, you also need to know their internal energy. Um, and I think that's it. So, but nonetheless, if you look at this, that's four double position numbers, um, each particle. Each particle. And that quickly builds up. If you start having a billion particles, four, double, uh, four billion double position numbers is more RAM than um, any of our laptops could ever handle. Oh, right. uh, it's a 64 bit int uh, for, some, for some reason. <laughs> You, you, okay, uh, yeah, you can save memory by setting it to be just the uh, 8-bit int if you, if you don't have too many particles. So yeah, um, so particle number is the biggest limitation when it comes to running the simulation. So when you're picking the simulation resolution, you'll generally have to ask, what's the maximum amount of particles I can afford? And then go back and say, what kind of box should I simulate these particles in given that's the, um, that's the limit. And we'll talk about later about how to pick box sizes to resolve uh, different parts of the, uh, different scales. So you know which, uh, if you know which scale you're particularly interested in, you can tune your box and particle numbers to look into that particular regime. So yeah, um, that's the particle and the boxes. So the next one is the big one is the force solver. So this is the main algorithm on how do you get um, the, the gravitational force given the ensemble of particles. And this is usually the main differentiating factor between different n-body codes. Um, there are some obvious bad choices, but most of them are quite close in terms of performance. And ultimately, ultimately it's just the cost benefit analysis. And you have to ask yourself, um, getting that a slightly extra bit of resolution is it worth the 100 gigabytes extra memory that I'm dumping into it. So the goal at the end of the day is to calculate the gravitational force for each simulation particle should experience in the presence of all the other particles in the box. So let's start with the dumb way. So the dumbest way is the particle-particle method, or also known as the PP method. This method is essentially if we wrote down the Poisson equation or wrote down a Newtonian equation for gravity and switch off our brain and stop right there and just say, okay, how do we calculate this? And everybody remember your Newtonian uh, gravity equation. So for the ith particle inside the box, it will feel a force given by the sum of all the other particles in the box, J equals one to N, uh, where J is not equal to I. G, M, I, 
mj i minus rj divided by Am I using this wrong? So yeah, so for every particle, you do this summation, and then you do this for every single particle in the box. So you can see at every time step, you will need to perform n times n minus one evaluations. So this algorithm essentially scales as n squared, which means if you want to run a billion particles with this method, you're gonna be sitting there for a very long time uh, wondering what's happening. Um, I think, on Katana, um, a single node has 32 CPU cores. And if you run 1 billion particles in a reasonably sized box, then the simulation probably take on the order of like years or maybe even decades. I think um, Yepa Dakin uh, ran a test 32 particle PP method simulation and it took about eight hours. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, this is definitely not the way to go. But for the sake of completeness, let's just go through with the actual implement, implementation nonetheless, since um, it does actually lend perspective into the force calculations um, for other met uh, smarter methods. So what we actually want to calculate in the box is the density contrast delta rho, as we defined before. So that's the rho, uh, rho minus rho bar. That's delta rho. And Let's not forget, this becomes very complicated because we have technically infinite number of boxes because of the way that we have one primary box and then all the other images that built uh, along each direction. So we have technically infinite number of particles to account for in this density calculation. So one on A cubed, sum over all the particles from the first one to the nth one, times the mass of the particle. Of, they're, they're usually the same mass, but for sake of generality, I'll just label each individual mass as mi. And then now you must sum over all the boxes. So the n represents an integer vector in 3D. So this n denotes which box you are at in any direction that you're looking at, the image box. And in those you have a direct delta psi plus n times the L is the length of the box. minus the position you're looking at, minus L to the minus three. So yeah, um, this last bit, L to the minus three, if you take it out of front, you can see this is just the average density per box. So you're essentially going through every single box in the infinite number of boxes you have, and then picking out every single particle position and then multiplying by their mass, and then that's how you get your evaluate, uh, and then subtracting by the average density, and that's how you get the density, um, not the contrast, but the, um, the density perturbation from the average. So if you want to do this, you realize that it's obviously going to be infinite. So we're going to have to do some uh, quote unquote renormalization. So um, what we first want to do is to just take the, um, take this expression as uh, we're given and then try to compute the Poisson equation and get the gravitational potential out of it. And the gravitational potential we get from this, that's the eraser, from this um, energy density, phi x is equal to minus g on a sum of one to n mi, one over xi plus n l minus x. If you're wondering how we got here, it's something something Green's function. Um, I don't remember how to say that, but yeah, it's just the um, yeah, it's just the Green's function. Um, and yeah, so in order to get here, um, we had to we in the intermediate step we skipped something. But um, what we essentially did was we rather than using delta rho, we switched back to using uh, rho as a variable, and we removed and the infinite term, the infinity coming from here manually. So we subtracted that off because we know that's going to be infinite. Uh, it will become clear later. Like it sounds, it sounds super illegal right now, but we'll justify this uh, decision in a second. So this infinity was manually removed.
And the problem now we're looking at this is that we still have an infinity in here. So if we do this sum, it's still not gonna um, be a finite answer. So we need to um, do something else clever in order to justify, first of all, why we remove the first infinity and how to make this uh, thing finite. So this procedure, they call it the evil summation. And the idea is actually quite simple. The evil summation essentially breaks up, so it's, um, yeah, breaks up the long range force from the short range force. And the way to do that is to multiply a, just a unity one onto your Poisson equation, but we, we write this one as the error function I plus n l divided by two x s. I'll explain what this is in a sec. Plus the complementary error function. So these two add to one. So that's why we can do this. So this x s is some scale that we get to choose some length scale. And it's essentially the length that we choose to break apart when uh, larger than this length, we call it the long range force and shorter than this length, we call it the short range force. And you can use the, um, you can use the mathematical properties of the error function to see that the error function, the first error function approaches uh, unity for large arguments and the complementary error function vanishes for large arguments. So the first term is the long range force. So this is the long range and this is a short range. So if we multiply the Poisson equation with this, then we're essentially splitting up the Poisson equation into the long range part and the short range part. So, okay, so this next equation is a bit long, but, and then you, essentially you will get your gravitational potential phi as firstly the long range part, oh sorry, the short range part. Uh, error function, uh, the complementary error function with the argument we had just above here. So the same thing there, divided by xi plus nl minus x. And then plus the Fourier version of the, uh, the long range part. So we took the Fourier transform of the long range term and you get an exponential minus k squared on, oh sorry, times x squared. So here is when, we, if we look at the, this um, weird notation here is that we excluded the, the DC mode in the Fourier transform. So excluded the k equals zero um, Fourier uh, series, the Fourier term in the Fourier series. And that's because the DC mode for a Fourier transform is essentially the average. So this is the average density. And it happens to be the same size as this infinity term that we removed before manually. They have the opposite sign. So I, I don't know how many mathematicians you have to kill to get there, but like it's physically fine. Um, so now we have removed both infinities. <laughs> And so now you, you can take this expression, so take this expression and you can compute the gravitational potential and you'll get a well-behaved finite term that even in the presence of an infinite number of boxes. So yeah, so this becomes useful later as well because the separation of scales comes in handy when you want to have a hybrid method. For example, in gadget two, you have a tree force handling the short range force and the particle mesh force handling the long range stuff. So they also use a similar method to EWAS summation to do the separation. So even though we never actually implement PP methods for a real embodied code, the takeaway from here is quite useful. Okay, um, any questions? Why do you have to use an error function? Could you use a theta function to 
to like completely split the long range and short range? Uh, yeah, I guess you can. It might just be, um, it might just be too like oh, janky yeah. in the. Is it when you do the Fourier transform that you get nasty oscillations or whatever instead of a nice uh, exponential succession? Probably, and also the force might be like you might have artifacts and like length scales right where the dividing line is because I think this one transitions a bit more smoothly than the theta function. But yeah, I haven't done the actual Fourier transform for theta, and I don't know how nicely it works out. <laughs> hey, everyone else happy with what we're doing? Do you need to put this uh, into the battery from the iPad? Fifty-seven percent, actually. Okay, so if we're happy with this, then we move on to the second method. Second method, the particle mesh method. So this is probably the most popular one because it philosophically follows directly from the Fourier space approach of solving Laplacians that we talked about in the theory part. And it has a very uh, particular advantage that the algorithm complexity for this is n log n compared to the order n squared for PP methods. So it's incredibly cheaper. You do have to spend a bit, of, a bit more memory saving a Fourier grid, but that's completely worth it when it comes down to how much um, speed you get out of it. So the particle mesh method, like I said, it takes the, the Fourier approach that we said before. So you Fourier transform uh, into K space, and then you solve for the potential, the Fourier potential, and then you inverse transform the potential back to real space, and then you work out the force from there. So um, in this case, it involves a bit more like um, numerical detail. So the numerical methods of solving a, doing a Fourier transform, so doing the entire sum by hand doesn't count. So you have to use some kind of discretization and a FFT algorithm. So in the case of a three-dimensional box, we need to do a discrete DFT on a 3D grid. So I should probably write down the, the workflow. So the workflow basically is that you, you get the real space density perturbation by looking at, the, uh, by looking at where the particles are by looking at the particles. And then you Fourier transform this into K space and then insert it into the Poisson equation. So this will give you, now you'll have the Fourier space uh, gravitational potential. You then inverse transform the Fourier potential back to real space and put this into some finite differencing um, algorithm to get the force in real space. And then this force will allow you to go to wherever the particles are, ask what is the force at this uh, particle's position and then shift the, uh, move that particle as you need to. So why don't you why, why go through the extra step of finite um, Because it's cheaper. So if you do the k times five for a change, you have to do it three times yeah. in three directions. But if you do the finite differencing, I think it works out um, like comp computation wise cheaper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason they choose it. I think that's what, what Volker, how Volker justified it. Yeah. But it's uh, equivalent in a sense. Okay. So. Yeah, in order to do this, the biggest question is, um, the hardest part is probably this first part. Because all these subsequent steps, you have some um, library to do them for you, especially for the Fourier transform. Um, we use a library called FFTW. It's called Fastest Fourier Transform in the West. I'm not even joking. <laughs> so yeah, so these things are well documented and is all there for you to use, so it's not that much of a headache. The first part is probably the only thing that you have to have a think about. So how do we actually get, because like I, um, like I said in the previous slide, we have to do the Fourier transform on a grid. So doing things on the grid means 
we need to, uh, using our 3D grid means the particle positions need a bit of help getting onto the grid points because we're moving particles generally. We're not really thinking about like any kind of like pixelated way of moving them. We're allowing them to move uh, however far they want. So when you pause a simulation and you look on the grid, if you have like a very rough grid, and then you, ask, you have a particle here, it's very unlikely for this particle to happen to just end up on the grid point for you to calculate the density. So you have to somehow smear this particle or shift this particle onto grid points so you get delta rho rather than in real space um, position uh, like a continuum function x. You have to sh turn this into a discrete like n is the grid points. So into some discrete uh, lattice um, density perturbation instead. So there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, each one of them just get progressively more accurate and cost you more time. The cheapest way is the NG, I can't remember what the last one is, uh, NGP, nearest grid point scheme. So that just literally means if I have a grid cell here and I have a particle over here, this is my particle, I just ask, okay, which one of these grids, um, these grid nodes, this particle is closest to? Oh, it's closest to this one. So I'll shift it onto here and put the entire particle mass onto this point. <laughs> uh, <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> With double precision numbers, I don't know, maybe you do round up sometimes to get in that situation. <laughs> maybe that's why they don't use this. <laughs> So yeah, this, this method, as you can see, is very rough. Um, you end up with the whole density delta rho field that's not a perfect representation or not a very good representation of the real density uh, contrast. You're gonna get like some shifted version of it. And depending on where the particles end up, they might have some like um, very obvious directional uh, preference in the shift. So this is not good. The next, the next order up, the um, the fancier one is something called cloud in cell. So commonly referred to as CIC. So cloud in cell is a, it's a smearing scheme, not the legal sense. So you have um, your particle and you pretend that it is kind of like a, I don't know how to, Okay, what's the one? Cloud? Yeah, you can think of it as a cloud. Like, think of it as like um, you have a particle here, and then you think of it as having some like finite like volume almost. Okay, it's usually like a cubic volume, but like it rather than having it on one spot, you smear it out into this kind of like larger volume, and then you allocate sections of this volume onto each grid point depending on who's closest to us. So the grid points around this particle all get in like a fraction of this particle's mass as contribution. So you're essentially distributing it uh, depending on who's closest uh, to you. So this way is a lot more accurate because the particle's um, density is getting shared around. So you're not doing a large shift across. The actual, um, but this is limited in a sense that you only limited to your cell. So what that means is that if you're on one cell and your particle is inside, this particle's density is not gonna to contribute to the next grid cell. So this grid point will not receive any contribution from this particle. If you go to higher order, the idea is, remains practically the same, except you're just increasing the range of this particle's smearing. So you're allowing further and further cells from the actual particle to receive contribution from the particle mass. But most codes stop at um, the Carlin cell scheme. So Gadget 2 definitely stops there and Concept stops there. PKD graph uses like some absolutely next level stuff. It does a combination of a, a cubic spline, a triangular shaped cloud, as well as this cloud in cell, and as, as well as something else, I don't know. But like, I, they have the money so they can do whatever they want. Um, so yeah, so CIC is um, sufficient. Uh, I'll, post, I'll post the lecture notes, so I, I, won't, I won't write out the exact mathematical form for the CIC kernel, it's not that interesting. It, you just think of it as like a weight distribution onto um, the, in the three X, Y, Z directions. 
But what you do have to worry about is how this affects the density um, perturbations. Because when you have a CIC convolution with your um, particles, then when you get the density filled out, it is essentially one over A cubed, <clears throat> sum over N equals one to N. W of N is the CIC weight. As some group point and then mass of n divided by delta cube and delta is the length of the the cell of a uh, one cell in your particle uh, 3d grid so if you look at this it's a summation but if you take the um the infinitesimal limit it looks like a integral so this is essentially a convolution so you can re rewrite this as having your cic kernel or the weight convolved with the real space particle continuum density divided by the grid cell size cubed. So when you use this definition of rho n to try to compute the peculiar potential phi, not x. So when you try to compute a gravi uh, gravitational potential on a grid point on, uh, in k space, in the k grid, you get an expression that looks like this. Delta rho h. So it looks just like the Fourier, um, the Fourier put, um, potential that we derived before, but you get this extra term here. This gris, uh, the uh, cell spacing cubed divided by the CIC kernel. And this is a convolution factor that comes from uh, doing the CIC scheme. And you don't want this in your actual force computations. So when you're doing the PM grid, um, if you see in the code in Gadget 2, for example, they will denote this as a decom uh, deconvolving the CIC kernel. They're referring to dividing out this factor to remove this factor after you've got the potential. So this factor is, is necessary for getting the density distribution. But then once you got it, you don't need it anymore. So when you get the gravitational potential phi, you want to divide this factor out to uh, remove it so you don't have this um, discretization factor for when you're calculating the force. So physically, you can think of this as we smear the particle onto the grid point for calculating the density. But then when you calculate the potential, you want the potential not on grid points, but on the position of the particle. So you have to reinterpolate between the grid points back onto the real position of the particle. So this deconvolution is this interpolation scheme that you're trying to get back to the real position rather than stay on grid points. And yeah, this, this scheme actually gets, um, okay, uh, slightly more confusing now is when you're doing the finite differencing for the, so now you got the four, the, you inverse transform the Fourier potential back to real space, you can then get the force field out of this. But this force field would then have to be interpolated again onto the particles because this force field is um, calculated on a grid as well. So you need to do another CIC deconvolution. So you usually see in the code, you're deconvolving the CIC kernel twice in Gadget. So it's not a bug, it's actually to, um, as a preemptive uh, deconvolution for the force interpolation as well. Um, but you've got to be careful. Simeon Bird apparently got confused and he added this second deconvolution into power spectrum estimation and that is incorrect. So, yeah. yeah so, he no, he never replied to me. So I, I emailed him saying, hey, what's going on here? And he just ignored me. So, so yeah, so this is essentially the particle mesh method. So to sum it up, all we did was we have a 3D grid in both real space and case space. And then we, in real space, we use the CIC uh, scheme to smear all the particles onto the grid points to get a density distribution. And then we Fourier transform this distribution to Fourier space, get the gravitational potential. For inverse transform the potential back to real space, do, um, numerically differentiate it to get the force and then interpolate the force onto the particle positions to move them. And you can do this um, relatively cheaply because you're doing one Fourier transform operation instead of n times the um, particle particle um, individual force calculation. So this one is a lot cheaper to get running. Right, any questions on PM scheme? Um, yeah, sure.
now um now we're actually ahead of schedule so we can yeah let's take a five minute ten minute break if, yeah if everyone else is cool with that actually I, I might take this time to delete some of the earlier slides so i can have a room Oh yeah, pause. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. I have enough. All right, so the next method, the third one, um, the fun one, but the probably the one that you um, it's the most complicated to work with. So the third one is called the tree method. The name tree method comes from the algorithm it derived from is an oct tree. So these things are used very commonly in computer vision um, to divide up a large image into regions of different resolution and uh, depending on the wealth of information located there. And you can like save um, your resources on the parts that actually need it and not have to just um, zoom into uh, everywhere. So the idea is that a 3D cube can be divided into eight smaller identical uh, cubes in a fractal pattern if you keep going. So uh, if I have the big box, I could divide this into eight smaller boxes like that. And I could do this again and again, and this process can keep going. So. The, um, as I open up the, as I go into more detail, we call this like opening the node and a node refers to uh, a box and where places where you have high, when you want high resolution, you go into the node and you break further and further in the, in the embody simulation, the maximum amount you can break is when you have, um, at least one particle in the node or, or no particles in the, um, in the node. But you don't want to do that that clearly because if you break it into the very specific nodes and do this, it basically reverts back to a PP method. What the octree method um, is good at is if I have a particle sitting in this corner of the box and I want to know all the gravitational force around it due to other particles, if another particle is sitting near it, I probably want to do this directly to know what the force is. But if I have a whole cluster of particles on the other side of the box over here, I don't have to, it's not going to be much different doing the individually between each individual particle. Or if I just clump all these guys into one giant center of mass blob and just work out this one force on the particle. So in this case, I can save a lot of, um, I can save a lot of um, evaluations for the gravitational force compared to a PP method, because for one particle, you usually just open up the detailed nodes around it and all the nodes far enough from this particle, you can leave them intact and just use the center of mass to work this out. So this method is slightly more um, memory consuming because to do this scheme at every time step, you have to establish how, how deep or how much detail you want to open each node. So you have to have, um, they call build the tree. So building the tree essentially means um, opening all the uh, nodes possible and then know where all the particles are. So then when you go back and make the decision from any individual particle, you can decide to whether go into the tree or stay, uh, keep the tree intact. So this happens maybe once every five time steps. Because every time, if the particle distribution changed too much, then you have to rebuild the tree because the old tree might not capture the same uh, detail. So this rebuilding happens, so in a normal simulation, usually takes about a thousand time steps. So this happens about 200 times. So it does put a bit more load on the um, runtime. And also you need to allocate memory to store the tree information. But it is more, uh, it is in fact like more detailed than the PM force because you can resolve particles very close to you down to as close as possible. Whereas the PM force, it is not possible to resolve two particles force within the same cell. So it has a, more, a shorter validity range, but it costs you more. So there are codes that use this, uh, this tree method completely. For example, um, I think Gadget 1 used only tree before they implemented PM. 
And there's another famous one. I can't remember which one is on a tree. I think it's PKD graph. Uh, yeah, PKD graph use um, tree as well. So you can do this for the entire um, box to do all the force calculation using the tree. But what's a cleverer, uh, what I think is more clever is to combine two of them. So if you look at the shortcomings of the PM code, it's cheap. Uh, it's okay. The advantage is that it's cheap and for long range forces is accurate enough, but it's um, misses all the sub cell or uh, subgrade level physics. So you don't get to know what happened between two particles that live in the same cell. And in order to overcome this in just a pure PM code, what you have to do is just make the cell, the 3D grid, finer and finer by allocating more memory into the grid. So what you can do is combine this with a tree code to use the tree's advantage of being able to resolve short range forces very effectively to uh, compensate for the fact that PM grid have this blind spot on the small, uh, small scale. So you have your simulation box and you break the box up into however many PM grid you think is necessary. And then within a grid, you, if you have particles living inside a grid, and then you break that into arc trees to use the tree force to resolve any subgrid level physics. So gadget two does this. So gadget two is often referred to as a tree PM algorithm. So the actual division line is not exactly on one uh, cell level is about 1.6 uh, the size of a cell. Uh, probably just a numerical reason to make sure there's no like sharp uh, turns. And you can do the same thing with um, other kind of short range forces. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to use a tree to do this short range um, force. You can use um, PP force for short range uh, for the subgrid level. And the ones that combine PP with PM are called P3M, because I suppose there are three Ps in there if you put the PP in the middle or in the front. So P3M, um, I don't know any codes that use P3M except for concept. And concept doesn't really like using P3M either. I think Yepa just wrote it in there as an exercise to make sure he knew how that works. Um, but yeah, so the idea is the same. So you take advantage of the, the thriftness of um, PM particle mesh code on the large scale forces and to help it out at small scales to resolve the smaller structures you use a more memory intense um, method such as tree or PP but then you don't do it for the whole thing so to keep the cost down eventually and to decide how the force gets separated between the tree and PM this is where the evil summation comes back so that tells you um, to use the evil summation to break up the tree force and the PM force and have them apply to the same particle and not double count the forces in, in a sense. But if we use the error function separation, then um, you never had a one zero split. So you would still need to, to calculate the, the forces in uh, at, at all ranges? I mean, you would have to calculate both contributions at all ranges? Or do you at some point then um, approximate it as a function? Yeah, I think at some point it just cuts off the tree force and says we don't care about it anymore. I think this 1.6 uh, size is the, um, the yeah. like well, the no, absolute cutoff. The, the, the RS. Oh, the XS? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. So I think I I'll look I'll look into the gadget paper again. But I think yeah, they at one point they just hard cut it off and then inside they will so, um, so probably hard cut off one point six and then X X is seven something value and multiply something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is um okay, so this leads on to the next idea, which is force softening. Uh, how do you spell soften? <laughs> uh, force softening. So what's force softening uh, refers to, this is a purely like a, a numerical thing. Is it, It's kind of physically motivated. So if we're doing any kind of like tree force, 
or uh, PP force, then you're essentially going to run into, uh, you're going to have to run into some situation where you have two particles that are extremely close to each other, or they might even go through each other um, in some collision. Now, let's remember that these particles are not actual dark matter particles, so they shouldn't collide. They represent several galaxies in mass. And if you have two galaxy clusters moving through each other, uh, moving into each other in real life, chances are they're just gonna move straight through each other because of how much empty space is in between. So these two particles should be relatively safely to um, not actually collide. But if you treat them as point particles, the Newtonian force will diverge as they get closer and closer. So as R goes to zero, the Newtonian force will go to infinity. So <clears throat> the force softening is a numerical way of adding in this um, additional physical effect saying they shouldn't actually go to infinite force because they are actually dispersed out um, distributions rather than a concentrated point particle. So the force softening is added as an additional length in the Newtonian force. Yeah, all right, in the force. I think I have a formula here somewhere. Okay, so yeah, so your Newtonian force F is given by G M I M J R I minus R J divided by, usually you just have R I minus R J squared, R cubed, but here we add in epsilon squared and take the power of three halves. So adding this extra epsilon in essentially tells you that even if Ri equals Rj, so the two particles are right on top of each other, my force is not infinite because in the denominator, this epsilon term still survives. So, okay, if it exactly equals zero, then this will just go to zero. But in very small, so if they're approximately equal, then this term will stop the F from growing too quickly. Too fast. So this is, um, this is like a rather arbitrarily set parameter. Um, if you actually run simulations with different softening length, you realize that at one uh, pass at some point, uh, making the softening length smaller and smaller doesn't actually change the results. So usually approximately one tenth of the average particle separation. is enough to reach like a stable convergent result. But most people, when they're doing high um, quality simulations to make sure to leave nothing to chance, they set it up to as high as one, uh, one 40th of the average particle separation. But it is, it is in essence a numerical parameter. There's um, not much physics in how to uh, set it. Okay. So, those are the main types of force solvers. Um, there's some other ones like you could do fluid. So you can treat the particles as fluid and solve the Navier-Stokes equation uh, on a grid. But um, I don't think that's necessary because those methods are quite inefficient. And to be honest, I don't want to touch Navier-Stokes if I could help it. Um, so yeah. The next part, the last part for the embody recipe is the time stepper. So what we talked so far is about how to solve the force and where the particles are in the box. But these happen essentially at one instance in time and then we do it in the next instance in time to solve the force again. So how often do we pause the simulation to reevaluate the force is decided by the time stepper. So this is usually, you probably uh, will run into this in numerical methods in math. So um, algorithms like Runcutter and Euler's method uh, oh, okay, Euler is just a low order of ring cutter. But these things are essentially time steppers. So if you're just solving a numerical differential equation um, in math, you don't have to evaluate a force. You just have to evaluate the equation. So you don't have the extra step that embodied simulations do. But embodied simulations still need a time stepper to tell her how often to evaluate a force because sometimes the force is very strong. You want to evaluate more often to make sure that things don't uh, just run away. But if you have um, very mild forces, then you can allow them to uh, drift for a very long time before um, redirecting them. So the problem with doing 
an embodied simulation is how long it runs. So the runtime is, is very long. So if you have a method such as Runcata, which doesn't respect conservation equations because Runcata essentially just takes your system at this point in time. It will make the guess for the next point in time and then ask, how wrong is this guess? If it's not that wrong, it will just go with it. But it doesn't actually ask any other guiding equation or like conservation equation to make this guess. So this guess could be systematically like violating energy conservation in one direction um, every time step by just a little bit. But if you run this program for a very long time, these small violations of conservation laws will build up and eventually you'll lose, um, you'll have a nonsensical answer. So the better option in these cases is to use something called a symplectic solver. The symplectic solver are essentially Hamiltonian equations that respects the energy conservation law because Hamilton, uh, Hamilton's equations are actual canonical evolution equations. So for interpolation, just like um, there's, you have a million different Runcata methods, there are also a lot of different types of symplectic, symplectic solvers. The one we're gonna look at is the one that Gadget 2 uses. So it's the simplest one, it's called a leapfrog. It's called a leapfrog because it separates um, the two, um, two operations. So if you remember, you have your Hamilton's equation. One of them is um, for the time evolution of the position. And the other one's the time evolution of uh, momentum. So these are your two Hamilton's equations. So you can think of the time evolution of position as a drift, where you drift the particle to its new position. And you can think of the time evolution of momentum as a kick, where you give the particle a kick to change its velocity or momentum, um, given the forces. So a leapfrog does these two um, separately. So it does the drift and then it does the kick and then does the drift again and does the kick again. So this alternating way of doing drift, uh, so D is the drift and then K is the kick. You do them alternating wise like this. So that's why it's called a leapfrog because you leap over the other operation to do it. So, okay, if you define the drift operator, so for a drift of a drifting over delta t amount of time for some x and q coordinate, you have the x coordinate. So you're drifting, so the x coordinate get changed, and the change is q on m integral. And then the momentum doesn't get changed. And for the kick operator, applying on some x and q coordinate, your position stays the same, it doesn't get changed, but your momentum gets changed. So momentum uh, gets a kick. So F is a force. So with these two operators, if you do them naively and you just do D and then K or doing K and then D, for infinitesimal time, so infinitesimal delta t, these two commute. So it actually doesn't matter how you do this. But in a real simulation, delta t is a finite like time step. So in finite time step, these two actually don't commute. So you can't, uh, it actually doesn't make a difference which one you do first. And the reason for that is if you look at the two operators we defined above, they're defined, okay, I didn't label them correctly, but like they're both defined for some uh, at the t initial time step, at the initial time that you're at. So if I do a, key, uh, a drift over delta t period, then my x and q state have been evolved to x at t plus delta t, and then q still stays at um, original t time step. And now if I do the kick operation at delta t, I should be using the x at the next time step in this equation, uh, in the operator, but I'm not. I'm using still the initial time before the drift operation. So that makes the, the two operators kind of out of phase with each other. And this out of phase, if I do them in the same order, so I do DK, 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 for example, then the drift operator will always be uh, out of phase and ahead of the kick operator. And that is a systematic error that eventually will build up. 
So the way to remedy this is to do them half a step at a time. So you apply the kick operator. Um, for half a time step and then you do the drift operator for the full time step and then you do the second kick operator for the second half of time step and you can do this the same you can do this the drift operator first as well so you can drift for half a time step kick for a time step and then drift for another time half a time step and these two are equivalent because if you look at it, if you do K, D, K, and then do another K, D, K, then these two will make up a K of delta T time size. And then or in the other way, if you do D, K, D, D, K, D, then these two will make up a D of one time step. So if you do this over a long sequence of time, they're both actually equivalent. So you, in this case, you can choose whichever one you want. And so now, because of the alternating way of doing the kick and drift, there will be half a time step out of phase with each other, but who is ahead gets, um, is swapped around. So K is half step ahead, but now D is half step ahead, and then K is then another half step ahead. So this alternating like advance um, of the coordinates eventually averages out and you get a much more accurate answer. Um, yeah, so... Gadget can do this even better is you can just select these kind of um, operations for each particle differently if you can. So if a particle is moving um, relatively gently and doesn't get kicked a lot, you can apply this once over a very long time, delta big T. Whereas another particle that's getting kicked around a lot, you probably want to do this over, only over a very short time step. So if I could choose a different time step for every particle, depending on their particular situation, then I could save a lot of uh, resources. But um, it's too bad that get, uh, you can't actually do that because the reason you can't separate these out is the potential energy in the Hamiltonian is not separable. Hamiltonian. Uh, So we can't save time by doing each particle separately. What we could do is separate the long and short range forces because that is separable from the evil summation scheme that we had before using the error functions. So we could have a short range, time, uh, short range force time step that is relatively short and then a long range force time step that only uh, comes in once in a very long while. So in Gadget, you'll see that the PM force, which is a long range force, occurs maybe here. So PM, PM, PM. And between each PM force step, you'll get, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, six um, tree force time steps. And all you have to do is make sure that at once in a while, they do line up somewhere. But in between, how many tree steps, you, uh, how many tree short uh, range four steps you need to take depends on how complicated or how many particles you have in the vicinity. So in this case, you do save more uh, resource because the PM construction is only done once in a while, and you don't have to set up the, you don't have to do the Fourier transform as often. And the tree steps, you can decide this by every time you use the same tree, and here you rebuild, and here you rebuild. So you again save your um, more resources by um, breaking up these two different time scales. What determines um, how to set the time source? There's a force resolution. So um, I can't remember exactly, but there's, there's a parameter you set on the, the tolerance for the acceleration you get from the force that if you get it out of the tolerance, then you'll reduce the time step in that. Yeah. Just <clears throat> on, on this note, um, this is also related to the force softening because um, if you don't have force softening, you will get very large acceleration, very large forces, very large accelerations, and therefore the code would try to take shorter and shorter time steps and would take forever to yeah. get anywhere. 
Yeah, and right. So you, you by introducing the force softening, you keep the time steps at a manageable level. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. So you set it so that the force that you're leaving out is not going to affect your physical results, but then alleviate the um, unnecessary time step you take. Okay, so to actually sum it up, so we have what we have now we can sum up as a general workflow for running a simulation. So all embodied simulations share like a similar kind of pipeline in terms of setting up the simulation. Um, the goal is to get the nonlinear non clustering, uh, nonlinear clustering of matter at low redshift. So this is a goal. And as I said in the very beginning, because we understand very well how to do the initial high energy physics in the CMB era, the BBN and the inflation era, we don't have to run the simulation there. In fact, there's no point to run a simulation in a um, radiation dominated era or like running a simulation in, during inflation. So what the general workflow is to start the simulation um, with the intermediate with the intermediate results from CMB physics um, plus linear growth theory theory and you get to some intermediate redshift so the initial redshift is high enough that most of the matter clustering is still linear. So you're not treading into the nonlinear regime yet because that's what we're trying to get. But it's also low enough that we don't have to run the embolic simulation for too long because as you can probably guess, the, um, the, repeating, the recurring theme for this is that everything is bloody expensive. So if you can get away with not doing something, you, you try your best to not do it. So for the next session, what we're gonna look at is how do we get this starting point so this initial redshift, how do we actually, how do we initialize the emulation, our simulation? In the middle of uh, the evolution. And the, after you initialize, then we will just run through the exact same workflow as we uh, summed up here. So you have box, particles, forces, and then you time step till the final redshift that you care about. This might be redshift of zero or redshift of one or two if you're doing um, comparing to surveys. So yeah, so today we'll just call it here, but tomorrow we're going to do this part on how to get to the initial redshift and also how to estimate some kind of quantitative um, statistics for us to be able to compare to observations because just looking at particles flying in the box is not going to be a very good way of comparing it to experiment. So yeah, any questions about things that we've done? I've got one. Um, okay, so it seems like you go to the go to great lengths to do a very accurate force solution. You have the tree at short ranges and things, but then for the time stepper, you go to a very, something very simple, right? This uh, second order symplectic uh, would. Is there anything to be gained from going to like a fourth order symplectic for time steppers? Um, I don't think so because usually um, the problem. No, I, I don't know. I don't. I never seen anyone try going up to high order uh, time stepping. So there must be enough um, accuracy with the time steppers already that most of the. So the error you get from discretization in the grid is much larger than whatever error you might get from time stepping. So if you can't solve the, the, the grid error, then improving the time stepper is not going to be worth it in terms of cost. What it might let you do maybe is pick larger time steps so that you have, have incrementally fewer force calculations. But if that's not the limit, then maybe it won't help. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if anyone tried it. Maybe. I think you've on this. I don't know anyone who 
doing that. I'm just thinking back to when we were doing the Ocean Atlas code when we were here. Oh, yeah. There's a whole section on what uh, Sophie Wong did with uh, did for uh, leapfrogging and high order leapfrogging and any different form steppers. Yeah. I we talked about it. He, um, so yeah, for reheating ladder simulations, he combined a leapfrog with a sixth order room cutter. Okay, that's nice. So it's because um, for his leapfrog Hamiltonian, there is one non-canonical term, okay. and he uses the sixth order room cutter to handle that term. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much to gain uh, there. And since, because the symplectic um, solvers, you have to write yourself. I don't think there's a standard library out there somewhere. So it's, I, I don't know if it's how easy it is to test them. Mm. Right, thanks. Very nice. There's also something you can test with conversion steps. Just vary your time steps to see if you get the same result. Yeah. I think um, with Gadget, if you make the time steps higher, um, you don't really, you're doing more force evaluations doesn't change anything after like a very big time step. So the convergence requirement is actually really low in that sense. Questions? No? Actually, um, I wanted to say, but are you showing the PP how uh, you use the, the, the images? The images? Yeah. Do we use this, do you see those in the um, other methods like the PM and um, yeah, good question. Uh, in the PM forces, I know in the implementation you don't care, about them, but why is that? I'm trying to think. Um, I think they do try to implement periodic periodic boundary conditions simply because that's basically your cosmological principle. Yeah. You, 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 you do want to reflect that somehow in your simulation. Yeah. Um, how they actually do it in the pure tree code, I'm not sure. I don't know if you get for us three long enough to be yeah. only about the latest tree. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, but by and large, um, I think most codes out there are, have some kind of PM component just yeah. because it's so easy to implement periodic boundary conditions and you, you want to have that yeah. in there somehow. Yeah. So may, maybe even with PNA graph, maybe there's some kind of grid anyway, just to enforce that periodic conditions, boundary conditions. Okay. I mean, it's known that for tree code, it's harder to implement these boundary conditions, but it's actually necessary because A, as you said, you don't want to clump, and B, because it's actually consistent with uh, the whole homogeneity and also should be assumption. Yeah. Yeah, I'll find it. I'm, I'm sure they do it somehow, but I just have to go and look for it. I think it's probably just one line somewhere saying that you have like a periodic boundary wrap. Right. Yeah. And it's just a question of how you, how you calculate distances, right? Well, I mean, you insist as a box, you always embed everything in the box. Oh. And then you enforce that, you know, you, you um, Yes, but then, then the, the particle that is on the other side of the box might actually have a very short physical distance because it's just one step through the wall from entering yeah, on the other side. That's yeah. that, that, would, that would inform your, your tree code yeah. because then the tree code knows that the distance to that particle is actually small and therefore I need high resolution. Yeah, but that's just simply saying that, uh, you know, this side here is equal to that side. Yeah, 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 I think I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so there's, there's probably like some like wrap around the algorithm that every time you put the distance in, it will ask it twice. So one's for the physical box distance, and the other one for what happens if I wrap the distance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, yeah. what is the actual shortest distance between these two points in my box? Yeah, maybe, maybe the point is that it's easy to implement the boundary conditions in a PM code, it's natural. Yeah, but it's not impossible to do it in a sheet PM, a sheet code. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a little bit, it's not natural to it, but you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, for tomorrow, um, I will, so I'll email everyone like, um, cause I prepared a couple of files that we can use to run like a little toy simulation to just learn how the program, uh, how the program works and how to use it. And 
yeah, for the problem is that you you will need either a Katana account to go on there to use their modules, or you have to install. Um, I'll write down the necessary programs that you need. So you need um, GSL version two point five or up higher. You need FFTW um, version two only. You can't use version three; it's not backward compatible for some reason. And you will need MPI. So either an MPitch program or Open MPI. So if you have these on your laptop, then we can still uh, you can still run these things. But otherwise, um, yeah, these are all on Katana. So if you have an account on Katana, then we can just uh, you can follow the example for tomorrow. Just um, everyone who is instead of Joe spamming people who are here in this room or listening in, just everyone who would be interested to try this out, just email you. Oh, yeah, and I'll just reply to everyone. And with you that. reply to everyone. Yeah. yeah, email you before the end of the day or something. Um, um, yeah, anyone who would like to actually install, uh, run, run the you know, test one on Katana. But Find that, someone who can give you access. But that information is lost on those who were not able to attend today and might want to attend tomorrow. So maybe just send it around to everyone. Oh, right, right. Send so it around to right. everyone, but uh, anyone who wasn't on the original mailing list, I uh, should just email you. Right, yeah, I'll just I'm reply not to sure who's actually here at the moment. Uh, Okay. Okay. Um, what are your email address? Oh yeah, all right, yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Yes, you do. Do what? Yes, you do. Oh, uh, it, may, it may be something like. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I, I always use this one. For <laughs> yeah, or, or you can, or you can email too. Yeah, you can. Either or. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that because I was trying to find a set. Yes, <laughs> then you pop up. <laughs> Okay, and anyone who needs, who doesn't have a Katana account, um, and is either um, my student or young student or someone's student, just ask. Yeah, ask <laughs> a supervisor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, for Marcus, I don't know how you need to do it, because I'm sure UCID has a cluster, but you... Okay. I don't know. I'll, uh, I can maybe also just use my own laptop or whatever. Yeah, okay, that, that'll work. Yeah, I don't think these libraries are too large, and if we're only running toy simulations, it shouldn't fry anything. Yeah, I can see I, I have FFTW3, I think, so. I'll have okay, now you need version two, that's the annoying part. <laughs> yeah, but it should be, should be relatively the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, otherwise, thanks everyone for coming and I'll see you all tomorrow. Um, not the same time, 1 p.m. tomorrow, so one, two, three tomorrow. All right, thanks. <laughs>